Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much for the for the invitation, Zvicek. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, I want to provide a bit of background now that there's also students around, quite 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 uh, some students, uh, in order to make the point that a lot of the research questions that we eventually um, dive ourselves into and try to answer comes through a personal evolution process, right? So when Zvicek was talking about my my interests on a number of different questions, they basically reflect the stages of my career. And so just to uh, provide it uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a fast sort of way, uh, my interest started, I trained as a zoologist uh, in Madrid. I then did my master's in, in thermal regulation physiology in the same university in Complutense. I then uh, moved to do my PhD on sexual selection. So that provided me with a background on evolutionary biology that I had always tried to learn more about uh, with a very strong focus on sexual selection, secondary sexual traits in red deer, basically. Um, so I had a bit of background in physiology. I understood evolution. I was doing at the time ecological work in the field with wildcats, so basically working at an ecological, absolute ecological level. And for my uh, Fulbright, I went to here to the US where I tried to understand or to apply that knowledge to conservation genetics on the long run. So that's where I dived into genetics, bits of quantitative genetics and uh, basically conservation genetics overall. And so when I came back to the UK in 2008, I wanted to set up a study system that would allow me to sort of harness all the questions that I uh, had in mind, but with a non-narrow focus, which was uh, throughout my career relatively frustrating. The fact that in different departments, uh, people knew either ecology or genetics or uh, biomedical sciences. So that, that aim to link uh, between fields uh, was a was a key drive, and was actually the way in which these projects came to be uh, when when I set it up at Imperial College. I then stayed there uh, a couple of years. Then I set up a replicate of this study site of of mouse that I'll talk to you about uh, at Oxford. And then in two thousand and eight, I came back to Alcala. So it was twelve years out of Spain um, in the in the long run. And basically, why this little guy? You you'll understand today. Now, the title of the talk is The Drivers of Individual Growth Rate Variation in Natural Populations. And this is, in principle, you might agree with me, a, an important kid, uh, fitness component uh, that is sort of related uh, with viability and with reproduction. But these have been the two most studied by ecologists in the long run, right? Uh, we can think about viability condition, mortality, senescence. Why? Well, because for ecologists, it has been very easy to document the start of the life of an animal and the last day of that animal and record death. Okay, So in a number of empirical systems, that has been uh, the case. Um, now, the other, when we talk about the importance of survival or viability, we're always talking in fitness currency. It really means that an individual that is longer around, we'll have more uh, opportunities to reproduce and hence eventually expectedly as if everything remains equal, it will have a larger uh, lifetime reproductive success, which is the measure of fitness. Now, another way of getting at that is actually measuring reproduction, but that only happened in natural populations when technology was good enough. Uh, technology in terms of um, getting individuals and using DNA techniques to infer parenting, for instance, etc. Okay. However, there are other um, key life history traits. I've devoted a bit of my career to think about sex ratio. And by definition, that is the one that could be called the holy grail uh, of evolutionary biology. Now, I, I think that if any trait will eventually replace uh, sex ratio or the theory of sex ratios as one of those being eventually more important for evolutionary biology could be growth rates. The fact is we know very little about them being a key trait, um, as, as you probably would agree with me. Why did it not receive enough attention? Basically because it is very hard to get a grasp of, okay? So in order to understand growth, you need to capture 
individuals successively throughout time and monitor those changes that are happening in the trade before you can then infer a given pattern of growth. And so the, the variable as such is complicated because it's just a curve and it's not a, a, a categorical variable as for instance, number of offspring produced, et cetera. So there's also things about how that curve happens that have even mathematical complexities and there's a number of growth models that try to address that. But that would be maybe the strongest um, uh, sort of hurdle towards advancing in this field. Now, why is it important? Well, if we go to the basic, you know, as if we were in a, in a class of ecology or demography, to the basic population growth rate, to the logistic equation, uh, this is population size, okay? So we see here population size growth, okay? Not individual growth, which is growth. We're talking here about a completely different scale, populations, but why is it interesting? Well, what we get over here is the rate at which the population is growing is dependent on the total amount of resources that you have, which is the carrying capacity K that can sustain a, a given size population, right? Now, at the beginning, that potential to grow fast is, is much stronger than at the end of the curve. That means that resources are, in a sense, being depleted. So if we think about any given cohort of individuals starting from age zero, the potential of individuals growing faster to reach the maturity first and start reproducing before the others should be a very strongly selected character uh, in natural populations. That's one reason, right? The other one, if we go back to the uh, genetical theory of natural selection written by uh, Fisher in 1930, and uh, with his uh, immensely uh, valuable jewel, the reproductive value, is that again, if you look at this equation in the, in the characteristic equation he came up with, this age is sort of dividing this bit of the numerator, trying to quantify the overall value, reproductive value of that individual. It means that the older you are, the lower your value, because the sooner you start producing, the larger the sooner you start investing in producing offspring, the larger your benefit, okay? So it's also in, in, in the central scheme of what evolutionary biology is, again, hinting us at grow fast in principle, right? Now, the general goals of this topic, of this talk, sorry, Jan, would be to ascertain genetic and ecological effects on individual uh, growth rates, and generally as well, disentangle the effects of different contributing factors to growth. So this is a line that <clears throat> has been going on for a while. And so this is research that has taken a very long time to emerge. So this is especially satisfactory for me to be able to talk about this today with some of the results that we have here. Now, about the specific goals, um, we will be able with the data that we have, a certain whether genetics has an effect on individual growth and what the quantity of that genetic effect is. Uh, we will be able to check in a natural population whether there is a strong seasonality effects in growth. Uh, we will be able to see whether there are sex differences in growth between males and females. Um, do abiotic factors impact growth? We will be looking at that as well. So we can actually look at the physical factors that are affecting individuals in the growth pattern. And even not only that, but abiotic ones like competition for resources, for instance, competition for food, which is an indirect type of competition, not a direct context between individuals. And then we could ask, can we disentangle the effects of intra and intraspecific effects in competition on growth? That's something that with these type of studies we can also do. Finally, does an endogenous sort of variable in interaction with ecological factors basically the perception of risk that you have in a given landscape influence in any way uh, the variable of growth, we will ask that as well. So let's keep this scheme in mind because it's where we're going to be, uh, how we're going to be moving around, okay? We start with genetics, okay? We have a beautiful chromosome. Remember that within that very general term genetics that uh, my colleague Giovanni Porcina criticized me for using, he always says, why not genomics? Well, it's about the genes, right? And so within the, the, the information that we're going to be extracting of these is the individual, individual genetic variation. 
Okay, so in this talk, individual genetic variation, inbreeding level, heterozygosity level, and a couple of other metrics are synonymous in a sense, okay, in, in the general scheme of things in biology. Now, we're going to be asking about these abiotic factors. We have rain and we have temperature. We will try to see whether they have an effect on growth as well in natural populations. It would be extremely powerful if we did. Now, we will look at differences in density, which are sort of suggesting that competition is harder here than here. This is the type of, of, of of competition that we would talk, we would call um, intraspecific competition. And here we have two different levels of interspecific competition, zero intraspecific competition here, and a lot of intraspecific competition here. Okay. So we can bring in those effects as well. Uh, when you look at the data, you'll be able to understand how those were brought in. And finally, when I mentioned the endogenous and ecological factors, I mean that there are also factors that depend on the perception of the individuals about a given threat in this case. Okay. So we could endlessly discuss with the that uh, already perception is also um, driven genetically or environmentally, but that's uh, beyond the question. For now, let's consider that in a given population, the risk at which you're exposed to determines in a way uh, or can influence in a way even your growth rate. Okay, that's what we're gonna be testing here. So let's start with genetic variation and come up with a prediction that, that uh, would uh, be more sensible. Uh, as we go. So the first thing that I want to recall very briefly is just that uh, genetic and demographic effects on natural populations have been discussed hugely since the 70s mainly, uh, with two main advocates, uh, which is Russell Landy saying demographic is much important than genetics, or and uh, uh, Dick Frankham from the University of Macquarie in Australia saying, no, genetic matters. And they were fighting, and it's one of these uh, paradigmatic cases in biology in which the, the vortex of extinction as such drives those genetic effects and then exacerbates the demographic effects, which then pulls the population down again and leads the population into even greater peril. And then the effects are again reinforcing. So it's a self-reinforcing extinction vortex, okay? But within these, there have been the advocates for which is more important in each of these, okay? Now, um, the idea is that they have independent uh, importance. So basically they have a net weight on determining extinction, okay? So no, as he concluded in, in an important paper, no species are not driven to extinction before genetic uh, factors impact them. Uh, in many cases, they're driven directly by genetic factors, okay? Um, now we need to give credit to, um, um, Charles Darwin for coming up with these ideas, starting to, to research about the effects of inbreeding depression. So let's mathematically understand how this is constructed uh, with this model uh, produced by, by, by Morton in 1956. And it's a very simple idea. The more uh, the inbreeding coefficient of a given individual, which comes from the similarity between the two parents, the greater the descent in uh, fitness traits, whatever those are, okay? So traits that are subject to inbreeding depression are those traits that with the increase of inbreeding have a reduction in their mean value impacting their individual fitness, okay? There are two types of studies that have worked with something. The FSCs are heterozygosity and fitness correlations. Uh, some of them focus directly on coding loci, on genes that actually do stuff. And then most of the literature then uh, from the 80s onwards focused on neutral markers, in this case, microsatellites, right? And they tried, there's a number of, of good examples of effects of neutral, of, of this um, uh, genetic variation measured uh, on neutral markers on fitness related traits, birth weight, uh, sperm quality in links, a hatching rate, offspring survival, you name it, parasite resistance uh, from, from soy sheep uh, example in, in the Hebrides by Josephine Pemberton, et cetera. Now, the metrics that are used could be all of these. 
uh, heterozygosity mean the square internal relatedness, but most it, it's clear that homozygosity by locus would be the best for natural situations. Trust me there. Um, I'm going to be providing an example from our own lab of three different cases in which populations being quite outbred still show these effects of differences between individuals in terms of, um, of, uh, of, of, in, of inbreeding effects emerging. Okay, One population of mice that I will be talking about about, of course, that Sauropodemus sylvaticus, Peromiscus leucopus in Chicago from a captive colony, but that just stayed in captivity for 10 generations, and lions in Etosha National Park. And for those three cases, we have uh, examples of how genetic diversity will be affecting some of these key traits. So I'll start with the case of the lions. What we show over here is that males that have higher heterozygosity tend to have overall larger uh, longevities, okay, longer longevities. Um, and in terms of the review by Chapman, the side effects that we're having over here uh, are relatively strong, up to even fourfold or 3.336 fold, the average force of that heterozygosity fitness correlations that sometimes have been detected in the lab and other systems as well. Now, the second example of inbreeding depression comes from another life history trait, which is uh, the sex ratio. This was published in 2017. And basically what, what we see here is that the coefficient inbre of inbreeding, as it increases, it drops down the uh, sex ratio of the offspring. And trust me, in, given, in, in certain systems, these decrease um, on the, on the sex ratio is actually an indicator of decrease in, in, in the fitness trait, okay? That's for these uh, Peromiscus leucopus group. And then the third one from the same species that we're gonna be talking about, even a behavioral trait that has not been shown before in wild populations. And we see that with increasing homozygosity by locus, inbred individuals over here, okay? Low inbreeding over here, you get that a behavioral trait that increases fitness is higher in the individuals that are less inbred, in the individuals that have higher genetic variation. Again, the expected relationship seems to emerge, okay? So in this case, males with higher genetic diversity have higher quality territories, okay? Uh, so the prediction holds. Uh, growth rate we would be expecting to increase with that increases genetic variation. Now let's think about what would be the predictions that we would make about these bio, abiotic factors, sorry, rain over here and temperature over here. Well, the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that when we're talking with this type of guys, rodents, uh, we have Svitschek here that should be nodding very soon in a couple of seconds, uh, the surface to volume ratio it's an extremely important variable in terms of capturing the threat of that individual to losing heat, okay? So uh, when you have a very small individual, the amount of surface it has as compared to its volume is too big. So it loses heat very fast, okay? Now, the other thing is that uh, with rain, we would be expecting that the thermal boundary layer, the difference in temperatures between your body, your skin, and then the temperature outside would be uh, reduced because that humidity actually extracts the heat from your body because it's much better conductor than the air would be. And when the fur gets wet, you would be losing that option. So we would predict that increasing rain or humidity in general could be increasing and having an effect on, on that thermal boundary layer uh, impacting it uh, negatively and allowing the individuals to lose more heat and hence having a drop in calories that should be associated with a smaller growth because you have less substrates to uh, put into growth when you're actually needing to eat more or, or compensate for the substrates that you're actually losing for thermoregulating, okay? So you have a, a, a neat example over here. Uh, of that effect of, 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 of how that, that surface volume ratio changes. Um, and then on the boundary layer, that would be with rain, this perfect insulation that you have would be reduced both in volume and in the amount of air that it contains. And it would allow the body warmth to be dissipating much, much faster, okay? Now, so the predictions would be very clear. Increases in temperature or reductions in temperature 
uh, because of the uh, thermal compromise that it implies would tend to reduce the amount of uh, energy and substrates that individuals can invest into growth. And so we would be predicting a reduction in that growth rate. Whilst with the rain, the more rain, okay, the more wetness, the, 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 the lower the, the growth rate, okay? You agree with me? Yeah. Now, if we think about the intraspecific competition and the intraspecific competition factors in terms of setting our predictions, it's very simple, right? Uh, in reality, we say, well, the more you have over here, uh, you're basically moving towards this right side of the curve. So you basically are getting closer to the carrying capacity. There's less resources available per capita, and that's why the, 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 the population is growing slower. If individuals cannot reproduce that much, uh, mortality increases at those at, at this level. It also means that individuals that are young have less resource to invest in growth. And so the expected reduction of growth would be uh, here and not here. Okay, uh, so that's simple. And in this case, for the similar case, uh, I just bring here uh, the Lotka Volterra model, which actually translates this K uh, value uh, from, the, from the carrying capacity of species one and species two uh, to bear. So basically, if they're competing, it means that you know, whatever the equivalency between these two species in terms of their competitiveness, which is what these coefficient coefficients bring, the reality is that you will be affected negatively by that increase in the other species, right? So we can compare uh, competition between uh, individuals of the same species for the same resources and between individuals of two different species for resources, right? Okay, so again, the prediction would be the same. The higher the interspecific and the interspecific competition, the lower the growth rate expected per individual throughout its life, okay? And finally, what would be the prediction for this endogenous physiological trait if you wish, which is predation risk as measured by habitat use? Well, we're talking about the landscapes of fear, what has been called the landscapes of fear. Some of you, I am actually quite critical with the terminology because in reality, um, animals uh, are exposed daily to these uh, levels and then calling them fear is a too loaded term that actually affects humans, uh, but not necessarily wild animals that are daily coping with many challenges and among them, the evasion of predators as well. So we have a landscape of fear that I empathize with. Uh, if this huge, you know, Alaskan wolf would be coming for me, I would be confronting that landscape of fear. And with my high adrenaline levels and completely scared, my energy resources and my depletion of glucose would run so fast that certainly for us a baby, I would not be able to grow as fast as another one uh, happily inside a cave, I believe, right? But how does that uh, translate? Or why is that important? Because you can say, well, in a given population, uh, you have what you have. And we tend to think as biologists and ecologists, simplifiers of the world like scientists are, and that's what, have to, what we have to do to understand it, that in reality, you know, it's all, a, it's all a matrix in which all individuals get their share and that's it, it's fairly homogeneous. Well, that's not the case. Because if that was the case, when you have a real percentage of available microhabitat of bush, you know, a type of tree, another type of tree and bare ground, you would be expecting individuals to use that temporally in the same proportion. But what do individuals do, which is the best one for providing uh, cover and, and reducing predator risk on oaks, okay? Encinas in Espanol, okay? So these olm oaks see how they actually get pushed towards the boundaries and all the other are reduced. So they are in that home range that they have, extending the amount of time that they spend under the cool, nice habitats that are pro protecting them from predation risk. So that's an, an option, right? So what would be the landscape of fear? Let's get one of our two populations. We have one, as you'll see now, in Valdenazar, Guadalajara, Spain, and another one in Silwood Park, very close to London. So this is our study site. And these are 10 by 10 meter grids that I'll explain in a bit, but this is a real landscape of fear. If you're a mouse, you need to be terrorized all over here. I don't explain it. You should be more terrorized here because there's no locks. Do you see these red lines? You should be more terrorized here than you should be here because you have many locks that you can run under to escape from the predator. But still, less than in this thick vegetation area where you have rhododendron, okay? Over here, even that risk would be much further reduced. Generalist uh, predators like these uh, cannot hunt them. And uh, let me tell you that uh, Southern in 1956 actually showed that um, 
the 80 percent of mortality in natural conditions comes from tony owls in england okay so they're going to be really scared about this guy because huge chunk of their mortality comes from more from aerial uh, predators generally predators than even from weasels which would account uh, about maybe maybe for around a 15 or 20 percent of the rest of the mortality okay now okay you will agree with me that there Potentially is heterogeneity, but let, let's see whether that's the case. If that was the case, we would be expecting higher rodent abundance in those areas that are better protected from predation. Is that the case? Well, yes, it does seem to be the case. There's higher rodent abundance under high quality habitat. The, the graph should appear here, but in a couple of seconds it will do. Okay, now, oh, it is here, yes. So as you go away from the rhododendron, you have a much higher probability rate of catching mice. Sometimes it's up to 50% on the rhododendron and up to a 5% outside the rhododendron, okay? Uh, very significantly and with a minus 0 0.41. Uh, okay, now another element that suggests that is that when we do experiments with seeds, seeds are not hidden in the outside woodland or in the edge of the woodland, they are dragged into the rhododendron, which actually has implications in terms of seed survival, but forget about that for now. It's just showing us that if they have to come somewhere to forage, you'd better come to forage in a place where you're safe. And that's where they take the seeds. This was a four month experiment with 500 uh, seed stations uh, within this woodland. And finally, it's, we have another element that when, when territoriality peaks, you get a much higher amount of old adult males and females in the rhododendron as compared to outside the rhododendron where you find the sub-adult guys, the smaller ones. So sort of it's indicating uh, competition. And at the same time, actually, is when we find the highest level of injuries in mice, both males and females. Um, in the study site. So it does suggest again uh, that they're competing for these areas. But as I say, the best evidence of that from what happens at Silwood is that when we use multi-state capture recapture models, uh, this was done with, with uh, Sarah Kubines currently in the CNRS, we observed that there was a very important increase in survival rates. Uh, and these multi-state capture recapture models are very interesting because you track the life of the individual. You don't compare or separate the populations in one type of habitat use and another type of habitat use. You include the recording of, of that particular individual throughout its life in a Areas where there's high predation risk and where there's low. So from the perspective of the modeling, it's much more powerful than other types of evidence, right? And when we compare Silwood and Valdenazar, we actually see that both rhododendron in, this comes from Silwood Park, uh, does not overlap with the coefficient of zero. So the risk of mortality is decreased uh, in other set of models that we did when you actually live under rhododendron as compared to other bushes that are uh, lighter in the effect or even in, 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 in Valdenazar, the same species Apodemus sylvaticus suffers this decrease. These are just two measures of space use. Lock is the one that is more sort of more precise, but we compared both. And still the pattern is the same. Interestingly, in Musas pretus, we, I'm not talking about this species now, there doesn't seem to be significant. Uh, oh, this is the first. I'm sorry? Someone online. Did oh, that. okay. <laughs> Maybe they want to make a question now. I don't know. Um, and so basically these species wouldn't be suffering that, which makes sense partly because they're much more diurnal. So maybe the efficiency of these structures to reduce predation are different, right? So clearly, as we said in the previous ones, you know, the growth rate would be uh, reduced with this predation risk, okay? So what do we need to answer the question? Well, we need to capture, mark, and monitor animals throughout their life to, in order to record their growth. We need tissue samples to genotype those individuals and see who has higher or lower in breeding levels. Uh, we need to measure population abundance in the study site at a very high rate. So we need to capture individuals very frequently and then check uh, with some sort of technology whether they're there or not. And you'll see that technology. And that will allow us to calculate how many individuals you're competing with of your own species and of the other species by controlling who you have with you sharing the same environment. And then if the habitat is not homogeneous, a measure of how many individuals one animal interacts with. So that would give you the real inference on competition. There's two ways in which we can actually do that. Now, that is nothing new in terms of following animals and all of these uh, excellent um, book 
case studies actually have gone through what we call uh, long-term ecological research uh, projects are, are fundamental and they are very well uh, sort of, uh, and their benefits are very well dissected in this paper by, by Tim Clattenbrock and Ben Sheldon in 2010. But I'll add some fine tuning that some of these projects actually require in order to increase even more the power that they have. They're powerful at linking life history stages. They are powerful at helping us understand age and social structure because we track individuals and we can, from observations, know where they are. They help us get at fitness measures because we can see which individuals reproduce better or which ones live more as compared to the ones that don't. And then do analysis because we have already recorded the phenotypic traits uh, of any sort, physiological, behavioral, uh, you name it, that uh, might be having that effect on fitness, but we can test for that. So that was a great push forward to the science of ecology and evolution. And we can actually get at the quantitative genetic estimates, specifically the estimates of, of, of selection, right? Um, and we can even link effects between generations because we know uh, who's who, basically, who, whether each individual comes from uh, one individual or another. So basically, we have these pedigrees, okay, that we can reconstruct from molecular data. Uh, Luzka Kruk and many people in Edinburgh have done a fantastic job uh, at... at um, um, at, at working on, on these topics as well. So basically the fine tuning, what do I mean by fine tuning, is making the projects more spatially explicit, which is what actually started happening here in 2008 when I set up the project. Uh, the other thing is that that would allow us to know when a given individual is somewhere. So when and where an individual is, which is powerful because we can then have uh, understand how selection varies in space and what is where the individual is, okay, basically what things are there where the individual is. So we can actually make inferences about that particular spatial unit in which the animal is. Is there more food? Is there less food? Is there more predation risk? Is there less predation risk? Is there more competition? Is there less competition? So this allows us knowing what individuals select and potentially make hypotheses about why, right? So here, uh, what we do, uh, is actually record, as I said over here, logs, tree trunks, stumps, uh, all of these are the different seed producing trees and areas that are uh, important for cover, as we mentioned before. Okay, so these are the data loggers that we use to monitor when individuals come and go after they have been marked. And this is overall the three chunks of information that we're recording. Uh, sort of uh, phenotypic data, encompassing physiology, behavior, and morphology. We then from that deduce survival, reproduction, and now growth. And we get at life history that way, being able to calculate changes uh, in the land and population growth rate throughout time and link it partly to these changes, okay? So we can actually get that feedback from uh, ecology to sort of evolution through this side. Here is coefficients of selection, heritabilities, and in principle, this framework would allow you to do that if you're capable of parameterizing with intense monitoring all these traits. Okay. And what, what does that give us? Well, it gives us the mechanism that are so hard to understand the link between the environment, the biotic and abiotic, and the population responses. And when we can do that, uh, the rewards can be uh, potentially major. So we have uh, the population of Silver Park, Obvious to say, but mice have has generation times, populations fluctuate. Easy to collect data. You don't need to get trains or helicopters, uh, sorry, trains, cars, or helicopters to actually monitor where individuals are. They have a small home ranges that you can characterize and have actually you can do it yourself, maybe working 17 hours a day. But if you have the 17 hours a day for five months, you can do it. And then with a bunch of students, then your efficient is much, much better. And that allows you to characterize the community well. And so for now, we have these two studies. There's a third one in South of Spain being set up. Um, Irene and Marco are doing a great job there, part of my team as well. And here in the Bosque de Valdenazar, we do sort of the same, just to put you a, a picture. So we try to have study sites that are natural in terms of the fauna that they have and the community of, of, of animals that they actually 
have. So basically, we have a very well nurtured sort of uh, community of predators. Uh, here we have a Janet. Here we have a uh, 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 is it a pine marten? It's a pine marten. Yeah. So basically, we do that because in the data loggers that we have, we not only monitor mites, we also monitor environmental uh, parameters, abiotic as well. And on the other side, that's the problem with this picture. Uh, you get a camera. So. And this is the picture that that camera takes and this one. So we have for the last three years, pictures of 60 or 70 carnivores. And then we can start playing also with the spatially explicit predation risk, just in case there are changes there. Uh, but that's work in progress, okay? Uh, and the two species that we sort of monitor there would be Silvaticus as in Silwood Park and then Muspretus, for which we have much less data. Now, what we do is we just put these traps much better covered. Of course, we have these devices over here or these well covered, but for you to see the structures in which we use these stumps, hazel over here, the base of trees and these logs, and that's where we get the highest probability probability chance of capturing these mice. As you can see, they do these nice bedrooms inside the, 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 um, the sort of their, their, their trap. So uh, I'm very happy to say that we have the lowest mortality uh, events that I have seen in any rodent study, which makes me very proud. Uh, we do some other things and some other tweaks in the traps that allow us to keep more food and keep them warmer. Um, now, once we have done that, we need to actually go to the bottom line. What is our response variable? And we said it's growth. So how do we get at that? Well, in this case, I just used uh, lowest functions. Um, it's a type of regression that actually tries to go through many of the points, giving it a lot of realism. Um, and it's good to track, uh, not to create general models of a given population, but just to track the individual uh, uh, trajectories in growth. So we, we use these functions uh, and on 240 uh, individuals, uh, we get the trapping weight to predict and reconstruct the mouse daily growth rate. So we go to the daily growth rate. For instance, from mouse one, I had 40 data points. For mouse 21, I have 27 data points. From those two, I am able, a bit of magic imputation techniques, to reconstruct the whole life of this animal up to 324 days, last time he was caught, and mouse to uh, M21, 336, okay, days. So I have, uh, I reconstruct the daily growth rates for each of these guys. So basically for mouse one, the 40 uh, weights would transform directly into the 324 data points for here, okay? And exactly the same for mouse 21. Imagine that for the whole uh, data set of mice, and we do that, I, I bring this again here, because you need to be aware that we will be having daily estimates of abiotic factors and competition for each one of the individuals, okay? The data comes by individuals. And so uh, we have these structures that I've mentioned before, and now let's see how it really works. So if you see these 10 by 10 grids, we have these stumps, and this is the area. And when we put a data logger in a given area, we know the 10 by 10 meter grid in which within the 10 by 10 meter grid, we put it, okay? So we randomize these blocks, okay? Which is 100 meter squares each, but within each block, we have also another 100 meter grid that we resample and, uh, and, and, and basically, if you have the 1-1, one, one, you put the box here. You have the 5-5, five, five, you put it here. If you get the 9-1, you would put it here. And then the 9-9, nine, nine, you would put it here. Okay. So basically, it's just a random number generator in which we never uh, repeat the location until we have gone through the whole pattern at both the scales. Okay. So that allows us to not repeat and have a very a thorough sampling. And one thing I don't mention over here is that we have like 10 data loggers in both populations, okay? So we have 20 data loggers going around. These are the data loggers. Um, what do we do? We just put very little food because otherwise we would bias the animals and we would create a culture for finding peanuts and we don't want that, okay? So these are not automatic refillers. It has to go through the hard pain of all my students just going, taking the box, putting one peanut, taking the box, you know, 50 meters on the other direction. And that allows for the individual to boom, meet the box suddenly, not knowing where it is. So that allows us to extract the real natural behavior of this animal in the wild without biasing it. How does it work? Well, we put a bit of um, this uh, roasted peanut oil uh, in the entrance of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the boxes. There's a 
pipe, uh, PVC pipe running through. And in the middle, we have these antennas. And when the mouse gets here, this is the, the peanut, they get it. And this amounts to a less than a 10% of the, of the resting metabolic rate of a mouse for the whole day. So the impact is really, really low, okay? This is from a paper of Spigman published in the Journal of Zoology uh, with another colleague of his. Um, okay. And uh, and yeah, and, and so that, that's how that calculation was done. Now, we get over here individual ID for all of the individuals we have a tag. So we know if it's, uh, you know, seven long tag number that then gives a sequential ID, mouse 400, female 600, whatever, in both populations, we get a time tag for when it came in and a meter resolution, as I told you before, spatial location, okay? So that's what we do. So on day one, we, we, we move the boxes at 11, 12 a.m. And then uh, we download all the data that they have. Next day, we come again. We download all the data from that previous night from each data logger. And we reposition that data logger in the next random position. And we do that. And we do that. And we do that. And eventually, once we have done that, we can reconstruct home ranges. We can actually see activity patterns in times. And we can actually use and get at social networks as well. Okay. Of course we can also see how long an individual lives because we don't need to track him directly when it starts not coming into any of the boxes in the in the data in the data set we are actually getting mark recapture data so the mark recapture data has these two levels first the trapping data every two weeks and then the other layer of the daily recapture of the devices of the individuals that at least you have marked in the population. So the key there is trying to keep all the population marked in order to, for that data to be good. So basically, what would be the results? So we have this mouth weight evolution for hundreds of mice. We have uh, all the variables that we've mentioned before. What are the results? Okay, let's see. So we talked about the prediction in growth rate that genetic variation would be in a sense increasing growth rate. We said that was the case because when individuals lose uh, uh, sort of genetic variation. I haven't mentioned the mechanism that was worked thoroughly by uh, Charles and Deborah Charlesworth at Edinburgh. You basically start getting mildly deleterious mutations that pop up in the homozygote individuals. And those mildly deleterious alleles that emerge uh, are the ones that drop this fitness uh, of the individuals, okay? Um, so how do we do that? Uh, just uh, to briefly mention, these are the, the loci, the alleles, heterozygosity, homozygosity that we actually get. Uh, we look at the homozygosity by locus for early breeding, late breeding, and non-breeding. You don't have huge changes in heterozygosity, so no weird effects there. And as I say, we use this homozygosity by locus, which um, in order to be... Um, so that was actually... Um, Ortego and uh, Aparicio were the, the researchers that in Spain actually came up with this uh, measure on top of Mindy Square uh, from Josephine Pemberton and Tim Coulson, uh, internal relatedness also from the University of Cambridge, Delamus, et cetera. But this one is the one that reviews have consistently shown that is the best for, um, for showing uh, the type of ecological patterns or, or the depth of the inbreeding the population that we're interested in. I mean, these squared would be much better in order to calculate or to look at patterns that are much more profoundly embedded in the pedigree. And each week can, you can recover demographic signatures um, hundreds or thousands of generations back, okay? Anyhow, what's the result? This is what we were really wanting to see when we have a significant effect. And again, as homozygosity increases, you lose, you grow more slowly, okay? So mice with higher genetic variation grow faster than those with higher inbreeding, okay? And in the model that we constructed, actually, that value for the final reduced model of homozygosity by locus is actually even uh, much stronger, okay? So some of the correlations eliminated there, and that's the final model that we end up having. Now, what about season and sex? Well, this is not something completely unexpected. So there's non-breeding, there's late breeding season, and there's an early breeding season. The early breeding season is the point where individuals start mainly growing most of the population after coming out of the winter. So you see that the growth rates per day, grams per day, 0.06, are there. But we can actually get at these very interesting estimates in which in, in winter, 
and autumn and partly during the summer, you're getting at growth rates that are 0.02% actually uh, smaller than the ones that you would be getting in spring. So very interesting to have that. No effect of sex, red and blue. Okay, exactly the same. But interestingly, even though there's no effect in, in the growth rates between males and females, what do we get? What we get is a difference in the variance. So females have a much higher uh, weight variance that there's things to discuss, potentially is associated with uh, reproductive uh, mode in, 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 in females as compared to males. And so they have more variability in the weight, okay? We, we, we actually got at that. Now, what about the prediction that we had said regarding growth rate with temperature and growth rate with rain? Will we see, we had said that with growth rate would be faster in uh, warmer temperatures overall, which sort of matches what we have seen for the seasons, right? Uh, I didn't use a model in which I included both together because it was partly redundant, but that, that work can be done. We, we have the potential to do that. And then these other variables. So let's look at this. Interestingly, we don't find an effect of rain. There's a reason to discuss there. Lately, as I've been thinking on these results, but we do find an effect of temperature, which is quite significant, okay? Very strongly significant. So the higher the temperature, the temperature is measured for each individual. Individual one doesn't have a mean temperature for the month, for the year. It, it's derived, if I am born the one, the 1st of March and I die uh, the 10th of October, the temperature for all of those days from the 1st of March to the 10th of October is my mean temperature for my lifetime. And if Svitschek was born um, you know, three months before me, and then you lived for three weeks, those 21 uh, uh, points of temperature are the ones that come up as your value of uh, exposed temperature to match with your growth. Okay, so very specifically defined by the experience of each individual, which is something that in general we don't get in, in, in natural populations. Now, what do we have with intraspecific competition? I've been thinking about this quite a lot. Well, we basically can see that intraspecific competition has an effect. So the more individuals are, the less grow? No, surprisingly not. Mm. And so the effect is positive, okay? That's, that's worth discussing later if you guys want. Now, uh, intraspecific competition, Impressively enough, yes, in the final model, it comes up as very significant and negative. Okay? When you are exposed to higher levels of intraspecific competition, you actually uh, suffer those effects negatively in growth. Okay? And what happens with the predation risk as measured by habitat use? The results are also very interesting, but they vary. No general effects, but when you divide males and females, what you get is this. So basically, female mice growing under rhododendron experience a significant increase in growth rates there where they are safe as compared to those living in the open woodland. Males don't seem to derive any benefits in terms of growth of speed. They just don't care whether they're in landscape of fear, whether they're not. We, we might come up with an idea about why they basically don't care. They might just go for as much as they can in terms of reproduction. These are our uh, demography species in a sense, high turnover rate, high predation risk, and they maybe don't have that much to lose as opposed to contacting. We know that the system is in, in some way in which different males are not actually during that time defending territories. It's females that avoid and reject other females and maintain their habitats. And it's the males that try to go through all those territories trying to get as many um, copulations as possible to have a many, as many liters, to sire as many liters as possible. But in the females, that's not the case. And there is a very strong effect of the proportion of rhododendron, high quality habitat, on the growth rate of the individuals, which actually links to that very strong competition that we were seeing during the reproductive phase in which adults, strong and heavier adult individuals were actually excluding subadult individuals uh, that are already reproductive uh, in, during spring. Okay, so that effect seems to come up over there. So what are the conclusions from, from the, from the from the study, genetic variation has a positive effect on growth. Predation risk effects on growth is sex dependent. Uh, regarding density dependence effects and the predicted negative effect of density on the population, 
uh, still partly puzzled about this effect. Intraspecific competition has a positive effect. Um, you, you can ask uh, why this could be the case. And then intraspecific competition does have a negative effect. Okay. Now, early breeding shows the fastest growth rates. Nothing surprising there. And temperature has a positive effect on the growth rates um, that actually, um, uh, well, individuals, when they're pushed out of the thermoneutral zone, they can be pushed uh, towards the right boundary, high temperatures, and they would also uh, expend a bit of energy. But in reality, it's the low temperatures that they're mostly in natural conditions exposed to uh, during uh, taking into consideration the thermal neutral zone, the one that has this re real uh, effect, okay? We got the whole extension of temperatures possible from here to Sahara, maybe um, there would be a curvilinear or hump relationship here. And that's it. So basically the next steps would be to compare the two study populations in terms of these growth rates that have all, only for now been derived to Silwood and I'm working on the ones in, in, in the Guadalajara study and disentangle the effects of metabolic rate and genetics on growth. Okay, which is partly um, the, the reason why I'm here visiting Svitschek is that because we're advancing uh, a lot of topics and joint collaborations uh, regarding um, metabolic rate as well. So that that will be happening soon and then for now just just acknowledge i don't know what happened here uh that uh, i'm not hiding anything it's just that, and i don't know how to i don't know how to write in 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 unevenly spread uh, rectangles so not really sure but yeah i want to thank vidal who has been extremely helpful in uh, valdenazar since year 2019 uh, with all the support of this uh, town hall, the past team members from Imperial College London Alcala, there's over 40 master students, but I, I need to always uh, emphasize and, and highlight the excellent work of, of Benedict Gotzal. Um, current team members, Giovanni Forcina, Irene, uh, Carlos Molinero, who's now in the States, Marco Lorenzo, technician in the project, Marco Scalante, new postdoc as well, Esther Llorente coming as a technician in another group, which are always helpful to try to gain the, the, the most interesting data, even though it's partly out of their 100% immediate um, uh, labors. And then all the, t um, so these are um, undergraduate students, uh, undergraduate student projects, master student projects, and resident students from Imperial. Uh, the last from AG, from the, the last eight I supervised last year were really good as well. Uh, Rodden volunteers from the team, uh, Catalina Estrada, who is a technician at Imperial College London, Mike Francis, really helpful with all the setup and, and, and makeup of the boxes that I, the technology, and Paul Beasley with, with some other technical work and my, my current uh, grant, the funders, and uh, sorry, and, and for also the early part, um, Mary Curie, uh, so the ERC um, uh, logo should be here. And um, yeah, and, and thank you everyone for, for your attention. Thank you.